Samir, one of the deepest probes of the nature of reality as we've looked upon it is the tension between reductionism and emergence. Uh, I've pursued it intensely in the physical sciences, particularly in physics, and the tension between weak emergence, strong emergence, and also in philosophy of mind, where it naturally emerges what is consciousness. How does that same tension between reductionism and emergence develop in the biological sciences? You're absolutely right that that tension is present in the biological sciences. So if by reductionism we mean the scientific strategy of explaining how things work by explaining what their parts do and how those parts interact, so explaining the properties of wholes in terms of the properties of their smaller parts, then it seems that there's plenty of reductionism in the biosciences and indeed fields such as biochemistry and molecular biology, in particular parad paradigm examples of scientific reduction. And indeed molecular biology I think is a fantastically successful science. It's enabled us to understand development and evolution uh, in a far deeper way than we could before the molecular revolution in biology. So reductionism seems to work great in biology. However, there's, there are anti-reductionist lines of thought and sentiments and indeed whole sub-disciplines in biology too. So systems biology, for example, with, with its emphasis on explaining whole systems from a holistic perspective is explicitly non-reductionistic, as is a discipline such as community ecology, for example, that is an attempt to understand you know, how ecosystems work at their own level, if you like, rather than in a, in a purely reductionistic or bottom-up fashion. So you're right that we see that tension. The, the ultimate question, though, is in principle, in some ultimate science, can a, a characteristic ultimately be reduced? A classic example we use in, uh, in, in physics is uh, H2O for water. If, you, if I give you the, all the characteristics of hydrogen and tell you you got two of them and the characteristics of oxygen, be hard, you'd be hard pressed and need, immediately to see why it was wet. Uh, but if you really understood the, the angle of the bonds and multiple things, you could determine that ultimately. Uh, and that we would call a weak reduction because it is a weak emergence because it is emergent, but you could ultimately explain it. Question is in biology, it are, is there anything that it would be impossible in principle uh, to uh, predict from the properties of the, of the parts to get to the whole? It's a difficult question to answer. I would give a, um, an evasive answer personally to that question by saying it all depends on what in principle means. Um, because, I mean, the, the, one might, those, those people who say, yes, that's got to be true, that's, in a way, that's more an article of faith that it's got to, when they say it's got to be in principle possible to explain how things right. function by explaining how all of the components work. And the argument there work. is if, if that were not the case, then there'd have to be something magical right. at, that's at whatever thought. level that, that, mm -hmm. that's coming in, some ghost in the machine or... But I think that idea, can, that's right. I mean, and that's a powerful thought and the success of reductionism is um, a partial vindication of it or a, at least explanation of its attractiveness. At least two lines of opposition to that line of, to that uh, are as follows. On the one hand, one might say, well, what does in principle really mean? And secondly, one might say, well, wait a minute, what does explanation really mean here? Because explanation is bound up with scientific understanding. Yes. And us humans have certain epistemic limitations and capabilities. So perhaps it isn't really possible to explain in principle everything from a fundamental basis if you like, because the explanations would not be comprehensible to us humans and so would not be understandable. That, that, that to me sounds like a, a, a dodge or, or a rationalization that you know, we, we ultimately can't understand it uh, and that's the way to sort of push the problem aside. Yeah, Why? what I'm trying I mean, to do... When we understand do... fundamental physics in mm. all the way, I mean, to say that we can't understand it ultimately in principle, I'd have trouble with that. Yeah, I mean, what I'm trying to do is to sort of put philosophical pressure on the terms in which the debate is formulated. Yeah, I don't like, mind the pressure. By saying what does in principle mean? Yeah, what, what do we mean by explanation, explanation here? Yeah. Which are big, big issues, yeah. uh, but admittedly rather abstract philosophical ones. I think, um, you know, closer to the, the biological ground, if you like, is the question of um, 
you know, what can be explained on the basis of genetic stuff alone? So think of the early days of the Human Genome Project. There was this enormous um, belief, at least in some quarters, that once we'd sequenced all of the genes in the human genome, we'd understand everything else. We'd understand how development worked. All we'd the understand diseases. the molecular basis of all the different diseases. We'd understand how phenotypes arise, we'd understand the molecular basis of traits, we'd be able to clone things at will, none of which have proved to be true, really. I mean, obviously, it's been, it was a fantastic achievement and, and molecular level understanding has contributed to all of those projects. Um, however, it's a far cry to say that you can determine the properties of an organism from a knowledge of its gene sequence. Uh, an allied uh, question that's also very controversial, allied to emergence, is top-down causation. Um, some would say that that's impossible because everything comes from the, the, the top, but if there are activities at the whole level that are affirmatively influencing in some sort of a recursive pattern, things at the lower level, then th there may be something fundamental at the top or the higher levels of organization. That's exactly right. Um, so th there's no more controversial issue in, than the notion of top-down causation in the debates about emergence and reduction. So, I mean, advocates of it, they try to say, look, it's a fairly innocuous idea. It's simply the idea that the properties of an ecosystem, for example, some ecosystem properties, such as the you know, extent of the uh, energy flow through it or something like that, could influence the behavior of some organisms within it or the attributes of some organisms within it. So it's the ecosystem influencing the organisms that are in it. Other researchers say, no, no, no wait a minute, there's something fundamentally wrong with the idea, precisely because it seems that the properties of any whole, larger whole, like an ecosystem, must ultimately depend on the properties of their constituents. So it seems that top-down causation should ultimately be dispensable. If you think of top-down yeah, yeah, causation that's that's exactly as that right. arrow from the big thing to the small thing, right. surely ultimately the arrows go from the small to the small. Yeah, yeah. And I think the, the resolution of that issue depends really on issues in metaphysics um, rather than in the philosophy of science, strictly speaking. And, 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 but now that's a strong statement, why? Because I think that Ultimately, it depends on what we mean by causation and what we think about the doctrine of part-whole supervenience. So part-whole supervenience, also called meriological supervenience, is the idea that the properties of wholes are fixed by all the properties of the parts, right. including their relations to one another. Right, that's a supervenience. That's supervenience, yeah, where once you fix the, fix the lower level stuff, mm -hmm, fix the properties of those atoms, uh -huh, and then the properties of the molecules yeah. are fixed to. You can't do one without the other. Right, or at least, um, yeah, th there couldn't be a difference at the higher right, level right. without a difference right. down at that lower right. level. Right, where do you come out on it? Um, it seems to me that the strong empirical support for the principle of top-down supervenience, but whether it's universally true, I'm less sure, and it seems to me ultimately an article of metaphysical faith. Uh, it, it, to me, that's again a dodge of <laughs> metaphysical faith. Yeah. Uh, either you keep, ultimately, in principle, means in a complete science, given however many years, assuming our planet and species survived, um, that we would be able to explain it. And is there a, a ceiling that says we, we're not going to be able to go beyond? I think it depends on metaphysical um, assumptions, in part because it depends on how one makes the intrinsic, non-intrinsic, or relational property distinction. So, I mean, everybody agrees that the properties of some larger whole, such as an organism, for example, don't supervene, or su supervene on, that's to say, are not fixed by the intrinsic properties of all of their parts, such as the cells within them, if you take those to be the parts, for example. They have to also depend on the relationship among those cells, on how those cells relate to each other. So then it seems that in order to pose the issue accurately, we have to distinguish between the intrinsic features of the lower level in cells and their relations or relational features. The process of growth. Right. But then the question is, how do we make that intrinsic relational distinction? So again, what I'm doing here is suggesting that the terms of the debate are not as clear as is often 
um, assumed 